lucky day A soul that sees it Make it white as snow For I know a man Who
Let's bow for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this beautiful morning that you gave us and the privilege that we have, Lord, to meet together to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for all the things we've enjoyed already, the good singing and the fellowship. And we pray that now, Lord, to be with Brother Milan as he brings a message and give him the words, Lord, that we as a congregation need to hear. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, as you're turning there, I do want to thank each of you that participated uh, uh, last week in our fall festival. We had a great time of uh, uh, ministry, uh, meeting folks, and I know a lot of you worked very, very hard setting up, uh, uh, chasing after balls, running through the parking lot, uh, trying to keep kids from killing themselves out there. I tell you what, and y'all, y'all don't understand, y'all know I'm the popcorn man, and uh, that's a pretty tough job. I just want y'all to know that. I had to start an hour early to be able to keep, you know, keep up with the crowd. It wasn't so hard, but keeping up the crowd and what I ate was a pretty big job, okay? Uh, I told somebody, I said, I never did get to eat a bag. I said, they said, preacher, you was eating the whole time. So, I mean, I have to test each one to make sure that everybody survives. I talked about obedience this morning. Obedience. Here in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, it said, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. If the word spoken by angels were steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. I'd like to talk about obedience for just a moment. Obedience. Some of you maybe have a, a dog that you may have sent to obedience school. There they teach them how to uh, conduct themselves in a, Good man. I, I, always, I always get amazed when someone can teach a, a dog maybe to do certain things. The biggest thing that just impresses me, they get them to listen. To listen, okay? I mean, they'll tell them to stay, and they'll stay. They'll tell them, you know, to roll over or speak. You know, that's, they teach them to be obedient. Teach them to be focused and to listen. And they give them uh, treats for, you know, responding in an appropriate way. But I'm, I'm sure as teaching uh, uh, this uh, dog uh, obedience, I imagine there's uh, different things that go along with there's no rewards when you don't listen and when you don't obey. It, 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 not only, I, I've seen dogs having to be uh, sent to obedience school and learn how to obey, but I've seen them even teach dolphins how, how to do certain things. Seals and different things. Isn't it amazing how they can teach them to obey certain commands? I know I've talked to a lot of ladies that like to teach send their husbands to obedience school. <laughs> that would be that'd be a uh, tall test to be able to get them to focus, listen, to uh, follow commands, wouldn't it? Or what about a teenager? Maybe send a teenager to obedience school to learn how to uh, respond and, and listen to focus. Well, I'll tell you something even tougher than a husband or a teenager. What do you think about a Christian being obedient? A Christian being obedient. Because God does give us commands. He gives us uh, signs to follow and to listen to and to be obedient. He tells us here very quickly that we ought to give a more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. At least at any time we should let them slip and get away from us. We need to be very careful to listen to the command. If you don't get the command, you know, guess what? There's a penalty to that. I know it's football season. I know uh, two or three of you watch football here today. And uh, one thing during the football, uh, you get, they get up over the ball and the quarterback's hauling out the signals and, and calling out the, uh, the counts and stuff. And there's a lineman sitting there just, he, he's ready to go. He, he's ready to hit somebody in front of him. And all of a sudden, they're doing this here, giving the signs, and, and they're supposed to be waiting for the second hut. And he says, hut, he just jumps across the line, doesn't he? Well, he wasn't supposed to do that. He is supposed to wait to the right time. And what's happened? There's a reward that goes along with that. A reward to go backwards. 
to go backwards, not forward. The point in football is to go forward, not backwards. Same thing as a Christian in life. We're here to go forward and not backwards. He said not to let things slip, let things go backwards. We need to be firm, anchored, and not going in the wrong direction. So often I see churches today are going in the wrong direction, numerically and spiritually, going in the wrong direction. We should not be going in the wrong direction. We should be going forward. That's what Christ would want His church doing. In order for us to go forward, we must be obedient. We must not neglect the words of God. We should neglect the, our salvation that He's given us. He provides for us salvation. I'm glad and I'm honored that He chose to save me. I, I, I'm, I'm honored that He chose to give of His time and His energy and His effort upon me. And you should feel the same way. He worked so hard to teach us the ways of a Christian. And when we behave and follow the command and do the things He commands us to do and He's worked so hard to get us to do, I mean, it brings joy, doesn't it? Joy. Now, maybe you've worked with your, uh, with your uh, pet at home and you've taught him some tricks and when somebody comes by, you... you uh, you show out a little bit. You teach it to do a few tricks in front of them and they go, ooh, and ah, and they show them. It makes you feel good of what they're doing because you work with them and they're responding. Same way with God. He's been working with us and when we respond in the correct way. Now, I know a little bit about obedience and, and teaching uh, uh, animals to do things. I've got two dogs of my own. And I can go out there and I can say, Jump all over me and he'll do it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's about as good as I can do, you know. I mean, if I, let, if I open the gate and let it open a little bit, uh, uh, just a little bit, they're gone, you know, and it takes two days to chase them down. I mean, they're not very obedient. I can't show you any great tricks that I've taught those dogs. I mean, I, I do a lot of things, try to help them, I feed them, I do do everything I know to take care of them, they just run wild, run wild. I just wonder if that's the way we are as a child of God. We just run wild. We don't even know how to appreciate the things that he's done for us. My dog, so, uh, I have uh, two acres that's fenced off for those dogs. Two acres. Now, some of y'all may have a little, a little backyard, let your dog run around in, they just have his lot. Mine's got two acres. I mean, they've got plenty of places to run. There's trees to run in. There's open fields to run in. They water. There's food. You know, my dog just look at that fence just wanting on the other side. They just want more. They just want out. It's not that they need more room to run. My dogs are so fat, they don't run anyway unless they can get out. But isn't it amazing how we don't want to respond to God's directions? If you were to go down here to Tennessee River and start try to swim across, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're not going to go straight across. You're going to go downstream several miles before you get to the other side. Because you don't realize it's going to pull you down. That current's going to pull you downstream. In this life that we live in, if we're not very careful, we're going to be going backwards and downstream from where God would have us to go. We need to be very careful to not let things slip away from us. We need to understand who we are. Understand who we are. I, I think about Jacob for just a moment. Jacob was a, a man that God wanted to bless him. He wanted to do great things for him. But yet, Jacob kind of wanted to get ahead of God and he wanted to get it quicker, didn't he? He wanted to slip ahead of God and all of a sudden when his father was wanting to bless the oldest with a blessing, his brother Esau, what did he do? He, he schemed a little bit. When his father asked for his brother Esau to come and let him bless him and Jacob did what? He went and took some, uh, uh, some hair from off the lamb and put it upon his arm because his brother was hairy and he that his father feel of him because he couldn't see very well. He said, who are you? He said, I'm Esau. He wasn't Esau, he was Jacob. 
He was Jacob. But he was fooling and tricking his father into blessing him rather than his brother. Of course, his brother got very angry and he had to leave home and all these kind of things. All these things kind of happened to Jacob. But God come back to remind Jacob real quickly that I'm with you and I'm going to bless you. You don't have to scheme. You don't have to do all these things to survive in this world. I'm going to bless you. This, in fact, this is what he said. He, uh, when uh, he laid down to sleep one night, he said the Lord came to him and revealed to him, said, Behold, I am with thee and, and will keep thee in all the places where you go and will bring you again unto the land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to you. Jacob answered and said, uh, spoke out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. God's right here with me. I have nothing to fear. God's with me. And he made a commitment to, to trust God. But all of a sudden, a little later in his life, when he come face to face with his brother once again, he got scared. He got scared. And he said, well, i got to do some more scheming again. I'm going to divide my people in the half and I'm going to send half of them up this way and see what he does if he destroys them or not. He starts scheming again. And then finally he goes out and he just starts poor, poor me. You know, you ever got feeling sorry for yourself? I'm not going to ask you to show a hand, but I know everybody's done that. We get feeling sorry for yourself. Poor me. I mean, everybody, nobody's got it as bad as me. This is going wrong. This is going, I, I just got a tough life. I believe that's what Jacob done. I think he got feeling bad. Here's his brother coming after him. Going, and, and no doubt he knew what would happen if his brother got to him. He's going to whoop him, you know. Going to take my life. Uh, he just knew that. But he forgot that God then took, uh, said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. He worried about his, his brother rather than worrying about what God said. And remember what God said. And he said he wrestled all night with an angel. He wrestled with God. Until the time came, all night long he wrestled. Until the Lord touched him on his thigh. And then clinged to him and said, bless me. And this is what he said. He said, what is your name? He asked Jacob, what is your name? He said, my name's Jacob. My name's Jacob. Why do you think he asked what his name was? Because apparently he didn't remember back when his dad asked him what his name was because he said it was Esau. <laughs> you know what your name is today? My name's Milan Metke. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I know who I am. I know I have the blessings. I have the anointing. I have everything that God has promised for his child. I know that Jesus is coming back for me. Because he died for me. I need to know who I am. I'm a servant of his. I have a job to do. He's chosen to use me. You know, in this in Hebrews here, if you'll notice something unique, he talked about it in chapter one, he talks about angels. Now if you think about angels, you think about, man, that, that's a that's a being or a person, if you want to call them a person, but I'd say a being that that's godly. A being that's obedient. You believe that the angels, when God tells them to do something, what do you think the angels do? I believe they, they follow His direction, don't they? If He tells them to go wipe out a city, they go wipe out a city. I mean, they're obedient. But His angels being what they are, but guess what? He chose me. He chose you. To do his work here upon this earth. He could have sent angels to come and do the fall festival last week. But he chose you to do that. He chose you. The most important thing to a, a, a community and a neighborhood that, that, that is sin infested. That needs the salvation of God in their lives. That he chose to use you to reach out to them. Not the angels. He chose you. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's special when he chooses you. I'll be honest. I, my wife, Debbie, 30-some-odd years ago, 34, I guess. Hope, that's right. 
she had an opportunity to choose someone she's going to spend the rest of her life with. And she, there's a lot of choices out there in this old world. But of all the choices, she chose me. <laughs> Makes me special. Makes me special. I mean, I look around the room here, there's a lot of good looking guys here. I mean, intelligent guys, but I'm telling you, they're the only ones going to go home with her today. That's me. That's me. But that's the way God feels about you. He chose you when He went to that cross. What did the song say? He had you in, on His mind. He chose you. We're special. We need to know who we are. We have a name. We need to acknowledge who we are. Remember the promises that God had given to us. Don't let that slip away from us. We need to keep it constant that God loves us. And God's with us and God does reward us when we do the things that we're supposed to do. Also, He rewards us when we do the things we aren't supposed to do. We receive the curses. We receive the disappointments of God. We have jobs to do. Jobs to do. Let me tell you something. I told you that my wife chose me to take home, to be a part of her life. But with that comes responsibilities, doesn't it? It comes responsibility. Just because God chose you is one thing, but there's some responsibilities that go with that. Responsibilities. I, I think about, in the book of Numbers, it talks about uh, how the God was leading them into the promised land. And after some of them got to where they got exactly where they wanted to go, and God says, well, there's more to be done. He said, you need to help your brother. You need to go fight for them too. You need to fight. This is basically what he said. He said, and Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, shall your brothers go to war and you shall sit here. And wherefore discourage ye the hearts of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord had given them. He said, you need to go. You need to fight. Moses said unto them, if you will do this thing, if you will go and arm before the Lord to war, and will go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord, until he has driven out all the enemies from before them, the land will be subdued before the Lord. Then afterwards you shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel. You will return guiltless. He said if you didn't do anything, if you didn't obey the word of God and go take care of your brothers, you're going to be guilty. You're going to be guilty. Guilty. God's been trying to teach us to be obedient for our own good. Our own good. I was talking about my dogs earlier. How they want to get out. They dig under the fence. I have to do everything to keep them from digging under. They want to get out. But you got to understand, I'm going to keep them in. Not because I want to be mean to them. I want to keep them in and keep them protected. Because to get out and get on the road, get killed. Get out and get my neighbor's chicken, get shot. I mean, they can do certain things. I've got them in there for their own good, their own protection. God teaches us and gives us directions for our own good many times. For, because He loves us to take care of us. We just need to follow His obedience and not be guilty of things that He tells us not to do. I, I think of the, the New Testament when Jesus talks about the talents. He had expectations. When he gave them the five talents, the two talents, and the one, he said he expected them to do something with it. God given us our lives, and he expects us to do something with it. He come upon this fig tree, and he wasn't producing uh, figs. He said, hey, look, I expect the fig tree to produce figs. We need to be obedient to our jobs as well. Don't let it slip away. Folks, if we don't take care of things, and we neglect it, guess what? It's going to go down. If you've got a car and you never change oil in it, I'll tell you some folks, it's not going to last forever. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. You've got to take care of it. You've got to take care of it. Your teeth. You don't brush them, don't take care of them, 
Guess what? They won't stay with you forever. That you got to take care of. You got to take care of. There's certain things in life you got to take care of. You can't neglect them. I mean, your 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 health. You've got to take care of your health. I mean, if you got an open wound, you need to take care of it. You don't neglect things if you neglect it. Suppose your children, if you neglect your children, guess what? Your children are going to turn out right. You can't neglect that. A marriage, you can't neglect a marriage or it'll go bad. You can't neglect things. You've got to tend to things, especially when they have a need to be taken care of. It's a responsibility. Your salvation, your relationship with God is something you can't neglect. Listen to me, folks. You can't neglect that relationship between you and God. Just coming to church, that's just like me showing up to eat every night for supper. That's not enough. That's not enough. So often, that's all some people do with their relationship with God. They just show up at church. We can't neglect our relationship with God. Our relationship with God has a lot to do with obedience, that we follow His directions. Because He knows what's best for us. I mean, we need to get in His Word and understand what He wants us to do. We need to get on our faces, humble ourselves before Him so He can lift us up. We don't need to neglect. That's what he tells us. Neglect If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. We have an awesome responsibility. What is our name? Our name should mean something. You know that, don't you? If your name, uh, one of my, uh, my mother's doctors here in Huntsville... <laughs> I still remember his name. He come and introduced himself. My dad can never remember many of these doctors' names. Uh, he, he butchers them death, but this one he remembered. His name was Michael Jordan. <laughs> Michael Jordan. I mean, he told me that was his name every time he come in there, and I, I, I recognize him as Michael Jordan, but I'm just going to be honest with you. He can tell me that all day long. He still wasn't Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan plays basketball. I mean, I mean, he's, I mean, I started asking him time to if he could play basketball because you think, if you can't play ba- uh, basketball, you need to change your name. Michael Jordan both played basketball. I mean, that's just sort of in my, name, in my mind. That's what you're supposed to do when that's your name. If your name, what well, if your name was Billy Graham? Billy Graham. I think if your name is Billy Graham, you ought to be able to preach. Not only just preach, you should be able to live a godly life if your name is Billy Graham. Wouldn't you think? I would think if you call yourself a child of God, you're supposed to look a certain way, you're supposed to act a certain way, you're supposed to be a certain way. We have an obligation. Because God is going to teach us those ways. We need to look like a Christian. We need to act like a Christian. But folks, in order to do those things, to be Michael Jordan, let me tell you something. He didn't just wake up one day and go play basketball. He worked at it. He worked at it. He probably in the gym and he uh, uh, shooting ball. He probably went in the weight room and, and lifted weights. He, he did so many things to train, got in the film, watched the film. He did, he did do everything to learn to better themselves. If you don't better yourself, guess what? You're going to be on your way out. If you don't better yourself, you're going to be on your way out. Many years ago when they invented the first automobile. I don't know if any of y'all was there then. But when they invented that first automobile, let me tell you what color it was. It was black. It was black. It wasn't blue. It wasn't red. I mean, it was black. That's all you can get. What if you think that first car maker said, I'm not going to change colors, I'm not going to change motors, I'm going to keep doing the same thing the same way. We'll just say this. You see them being manufactured today and sold now. You've got to move forward. You've got to move forward. I remember the first, uh, uh, 
I remember when they come out with power windows, those buttons, instead of those. I thought, why would anybody, why would anybody want a uh, window to do work with a button? I'll be honest, I thought that. Why? If you're just too lazy to roll your own window down, you don't need one of those things. I got one now, though. I got one now. But if you don't move forward, guess what? You're not going. You're not going to exist anymore. Church, we don't need to stay the same. We need to move forward. That's part of being a child of God. In order to do that, you got to work at it. You got to be creative. You got to. You got to work at it. And folks, if you're not working at it, you're not being obedient. Because I don't believe the church has arrived just yet. I don't believe we've got what we need to be just yet. I believe there's some things that we can do better. Who is the church? It's not the whole. It's you as an individual. Me as an individual. What can I do better? You know, it's easy Sunday after Sunday to get in the same old rut, getting up the same old time, going in the same old door, doing the same old thing. But I think God wants something better. We need to get on our knees and look for and be obedient. Because I believe if we're obedient, He's going to lead us. So what is our name? What is our name? As we make a name for ourselves, we make a name for Him. We make a name for Him. The world around us is being discouraged more and more. I, I see uh, the direction that this old world's going in. It's getting worse and worse. I think somebody needs to stand up and do something. I mean, think about it. When the government was shut down here a few weeks ago, I know a lot of you that was out of work. Somebody needs to go do something. Somebody needs to do something. And I look around how things going. Somebody needs to do something. You tell me that somebody is the church needs to do something. The church needs to start being a church. They need to start being a church. We need to come to the forefront. We got a name to live up to. We got responsibilities. We need to be obedient to His leadership and let Him lead us forward. Are we going to be obedient? It may just start from just a very one invitation where we start saying, Lord, I'm going to be different. I'm not going to be content. I, I want to be better. I want to be better. I want to be obedient to you. Let us pray.